Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the past week. We have a couple things to talk about. One of them is that we're doing a lot of roundups for this week, primarily focusing on recapping our coverage for the past year, basically. Putting all the data together into one compilation and then hopefully guiding you to the most appropriate purchases for your system build needs. So expect a lot of those for the next couple days or so. One of them will be hosted by BuildZoid in the immediate future about AM4 motherboards. So that'll be a good one. Other than that, news in the industry, Intel's got a lot of stuff going on right now. They are trying to keep up with coffee like demand, so they're spinning up a new plant in China. G-Skill's got 4,400 megahertz memory. Firefox Quantum came out. Samsung has new Xenand SSDs. And then there's some stuff on Intel Optane as well. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by the Thermaltake Flow RGB Closed Loop Liquid Cooler, which is a 360 millimeter radiator plus three 120 fans that are RGB illuminated. The Thermaltake Rain fans at that. This is a 4.5 gen Azatec pump, which is one of the faster pumps. You can learn more at the link in the description below. For the first news item, several of the CPUs that we included in our CPU awards show the other day are actually on sale right now, at least in the US. The Threadripper 1950X that we listed as one of the most important CPUs of the year is currently $800. So it's marked down about 20% from its usual $1,000 price. And the other R7 and R5 CPUs are also on sale. So the R5 1600 and 1600X, which we assigned the best overall value award for the year, are currently about $190 down from the usual price point. The R7 1700X is around 270, though some folks did point out that Micro Center had it as low as like 210 bucks or something like that. So the reason AMD can do this, if you're wondering, is because of the multi-chip module layout of Ryzen. All the Ryzen CPUs, including Threadripper, use the same Zeppelin dies. So they actually use a smaller die, and then as we discussed over the year, they have interconnects, which AMD calls Infinity Fabric, between them. So AMD is basically placing multiple chips on the substrate, on the package, and they're smaller chips, so they're cheaper to make, they have higher yields, you can fit more of them per wafer, and that contributes to the cost. And because of this MCM design, AMD makes a single CPU piece of silicon, and they put that on the R3s, they put it on the R5s, the R7s, the Threadripper CPUs, all the way up the line, and then they just sort of fuse off cores or maybe some cores failed validation, things like that, and that's what gets your product segmentation. With Threadripper, there are four of them, and two of them are basically active. So the other two are more or less sort of silicon substrate interposers, so to speak, to create a mounting resistance. So that's why the CPUs can drop so much in price, because if you imagine a $120 R3 CPU is the same components, aside from some fusing differences or whatever validation differences, as the R7 CPUs, maybe some binning differences, you can see that there's a lot of margin there, which would explain why the prices are so good right now and competitive and on sale. So. You can check the link below if you want to find those. We have a short news article with all the sales and links to them if you're in the US. So first for the website news, we're going to have a couple of articles that will be published only on the site and won't make it to the YouTube channel for the next week or two. So make sure you check gamersnexus.net for those. And that will include a Cherry Keyboard review. We've also got some roundups on monitors, the best monitors that you can kind of buy in various categories right now, and roundups on SSDs that will be hitting the website. Not sure if they'll make it to YouTube. We'll try, though. Uh, we do have motherboard roundups and cooler roundups, GPUs all coming to the YouTube channel very shortly, though. For the first real news item, Intel is beginning Coffee Lake assembly and testing at a new plant in China. So this is obviously addressing the huge issue of not being able to really buy 8,000 series chips, including the 8700K and 8600K especially, which we still haven't been able to get a hold of though I've wanted it for a while now for testing. So to ease some of the constricted supply and prices, hopefully, Intel has added a location in Chengdu, China to test and assemble the i7-8700K, 8700, the i5-8600K, and I think also the 8400. Not sure if the i3s will be there, but i7s and i5s for sure. The processes will be identical to that of the assembly line that already exists, which is in Malaysia, and most of Coffee Lake has come from there so far. So from what Intel says, the uh, China-made 
CPUs should be shipping around December 15th, if not slightly before then. So hopefully supply eases around that point. Kind of kind of very close to missing the boat on holiday season for Intel, but hopefully that helps out a bit. And hopefully the prices drop because most recent check I did was $420 for an i7-8700K on Newegg, which is sort of upsetting because it's actually really competitive at the initial rough $370 price range. But at $420, it's getting kind of up there. So hopefully this helps out. Another news item from Intel, Optane 3D Crosspoint DIMMs will be arriving in second half of 2018. So this was a presentation at the USB Global Press Conference. And we actually talked to Intel about these Optane DIMMs months ago, first half of the year, right after Computex. But we were embargoed for a long time on those. Uh, it looks like they're finally making some movement. So the Optane DIMMs use the proprietary memory that Intel's been talking about for a while now, but it will fit in a DIMM slot. Mechanically and electrically, the Optane DIMMs will be compatible with DDR4 slots, which is really interesting. Motherboards will probably have to make some updates, at least on a BIOS level, if not elsewhere, to accommodate the Optane DIMMs, but uh, electrically and mechanically, they should be good to go. So this is where Optane gets a lot more interesting. In its initial deployment, Optane as a memory technology on the small SSDs used as a cache drive to us was pretty unexciting. It seemed like the, the problem Intel was trying to solve there was one that doesn't really exist for our audience. It's kind of a problem of uh, slow transaction time, slow responsiveness from using a hard drive, which really that's that's more an issue for like the Best Buy $500, $400 machine that someone's grandparent buys. Uh, so it didn't help a lot for the enthusiast audience that just you just buy an SSD. Um, did not help much there. But Optane Memory looks more interesting, so we'll keep an eye on it. That's second half. Uh, initially, the DIMMs are headed for server and enterprise, where big data is obviously more important. And then we know that the DIMMs will not be JEDEC compliant on the onset, but they predict uh, 3D Crosspoint ballooning somewhere to an $8 billion market by 2021. So as time goes on, it looks like Intel thinks Optane is going to work its way into consumer in more relevant ways for our audience. The next news item is also about memory types. This one is Samsung's Xenand. The Samsung Xenand will somewhat replace the old and now rare SLC NAND or single level cell NAND. We actually have a full video on what these acronyms and initialisms mean. If you're curious about how NAND works, you can check out that video full with animations to learn more. Xenand intends to reduce latency below the levels claimed by Intel Optane memory. It's keeping Intel's focus on latency but driving it further. Xenand also will start its drives with the SZ985, which is an 800 gigabyte competitor to the Intel Optane P4800X. The SZ985 advertises 750,000 random read IOPS with an advertised 3.2 gigabyte per second bandwidth. These are both impressive numbers that are highly competitive with Intel. Things look a little less competitive for the 985 when you look at the write speeds, where compared to Intel solution, it's an advertised 175,000 IOPS versus Intel's 550. This isn't a consumer product, just like the high-end Optane Enterprise Drive is not a consumer product. But once again, you should probably see it work its way down to us eventually. Next news item is on cases, so case labs has their Magnum case, the SMA8. That one's been around for a while for them, but they've just refreshed it with some new design elements. So if you're not familiar with Case Labs, they're a bit of a premier manufacturer, which uh, when I tell you the price of the SMA8, you'll probably agree. It's looking like $600, so it's an expensive case. Uh, the case is targeted at the sort of enthusiast who would do a full custom dual loop or something like that. I suppose you could build like a small home server in there and have a pretty good one. But uh, the SMA8 is going to be updated now with additional cable and tube routing options. It's got some more cable clamps and USB type C, more drive cages, and also case lighting that effectively amounts to a light box on the bottom of the case. So uh, that's, a, that's, that's a new way to do it. I haven't seen that deployment of lighting in a case yet. It's not unicorn colors and strobing, so who knows if it'll be picked up by the wider market 
Firefox has a new version, Quantum. This week, Mozilla released the newest version of Firefox out of beta to combat Google Chrome with a renewed vigor. And the most newsworthy aspect of its release is the touted memory usage. It's 30% less than Chrome, according to Firefox. So anyone who likes a lot of tabs, probably time to move over to this one, or at least considered it. Quantum is also allegedly beating Chrome in browser speed tests, though we haven't confirmed these numbers for ourselves. In a bid to leapfrog Corsair, G-Skill is now laying claim to the throne when it comes to the world's fastest 32 gigabyte DDR4 kit, something that Corsair said they had about a week or two ago. The numbers are coming in at 4,400 megahertz with timings of CL19, 1919, 1939. Like Corsair, the memory modules are made using pre-binned Samsung ICs, Corsair recently suggested that their memory kit should only be used with pre bend Coffee Lake CPUs, something we'll be talking about very soon, and G-Skill echoes a similar sentiment. Memory overclock to this high on hardware like Coffee Lake really isn't that practical. That's not to say Coffee Lake can't do it. In fact, it's one of the few CPUs that can. The problem is you enter territory where now you're binning for the IMC in addition to probably the core, because you, you don't want a great IMC in a bad core that gets stuck at 4.9 or 4.8 or something. So it adds a lot of cost, adds a lot of challenges. We've spent the last several days working on memory benchmarking and it's not trivial to get it working. So it's cool, but just keep in mind that if you actually want to buy something like this, there's a lot of work involved in getting it to work. Next one, Cooler Master. Cooler Master is adding RGB to their ML240 and 120L closed loop liquid coolers. This is joining the RGB party a bit late, but they're making it there. And the company released the Master Liquid ML240L and 120L RGB versions with six different effects through an RGB controller. It's also compatible with integrated controllers, if you prefer those, from various motherboard vendors, including ASRock, ASUS, MSI, and Gigabyte. And both models support the latest AM4 socket from AMD and should be available effective immediately. The ML240L will go for $70, while the smaller 120 will go for 60, making these some of the cheapest, if not, might be the cheapest coolers of comparable sizes with RGB support on the market. We haven't tested those, but I think we might be planning to test one of the non-RGB ones, which would have the same performance. Finally, Corsair has their ML Pro RGB series fans. These have been in the news for a little bit now, but we haven't really talked about them. These are based on Corsair's magnetic levitation fan tech that they've been using for a little while now. For the uninitiated, this bearing creates a magnetic field so that the bearing and the fan shaft have little to no surface contact, which results in less friction, thereby reducing noise and increasing reliability. The new ML Pro RGB fans will have four zones from which light will emanate and will integrate into any of Corsair's lighting products, including the Node Pro or Commander Pro. The fans are supposed to be 120 and 140 in sizes and have interchangeable rubber corners, taking a page out of the Noctua book recently. The 120 option is a range of 400 to 1600 RPM, while the 140 runs 400 to 1200, and they're going to be expensive. $35 for the ML Pro 120 and $40 for the 140 variant, both of which have a five year warranty. So that's all for this episode, as always, you can subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one. And a huge thanks to Wester on the Patreon chat for making us a GPU stand shown here. We'll be showing up in B-roll soon. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.